All right. Uh, in the past, whistleblowers operated from a position of weakness, often alone and afraid. But these days, the dynamics seem to have shifted a bit. In most instances, whistleblowers are praised for their transparency. Whistleblowing comes with challenges and dangers. And an example of this is perhaps the case of Angelo Agrizzi from Busasa, who gave damning evidence at the Zondor Commission of Inquiry. Agrizzi was arrested and charged with corruption, money laundering and fraud uh, based on his whistleblowing, as well as uh, a lot of other people arrested this week as well due to this testimony. Brian Hatting is the uh, CEO and founder of SICAN. It's a company that focuses on, on leadership skills and joins us in studio to talk about the importance of whistleblowers. It's so good to see you and thanks for coming yeah, in. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. So, Brian, just very quickly, what is it that SICAN actually does? We're an exponential leadership company. We run various programs incorporating latest neuroscience and neuroleadership and cognitive psychology in helping executive teams and individuals live more engaged, accomplished and fulfilled and authentic lives. Okay. So <clears throat> talk to me about what we saw happening this week. So um, we, we saw the arrest of, I think it was five individuals, including Angelo Agritti, yes. who came forward as a whistleblower. What is your response to this with regard to whistleblowing? So firstly, I think it's a misnomer. The whistleblowing has got a type of negative connotation to it. If you think of referees, referees aren't very like people. They give yellow cards and red cards and stop the flow of play. And if you think about uh, the, the whole concept of, of uh, um, honour amongst thieves, yeah. Hollywood's done a great job of making it seem to be, you know, it's just not the done thing that you'd rat on people. You know, you, you're a hero if you, if you uphold the honour amongst thieves. The reality is, is that we desperately need whistleblowers. We need, and not just whistleblowers, we need integrity and authenticity in the world of work and in the world of life. Mm -hmm. And um, so importantly, if we look at, at the whole principle of whistleblowing, it's, it's people who eventually are prepared to put themselves at risk because they feel so deeply about the wrongdoings that are taking place. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's so pervasive, unfortunately, not whistleblowing, but the wrongdoings. I mean, the president in his speech last night, very erudite right speech, said, he said, the revelations that have, that have emerged from the Zondo Commission of Inquiry into state capture and into other commissions reveal a depth um, and breadth of wrongdoings that threaten the very uh, fabric of our democracy. Yeah. And the fact is, is that if one looks at it, it becomes like a cancer and often starting at the top. So mm. wrongdoings here or there that might occur at different levels in organizations can easily be isolated and dealt with. But when it becomes the pervasive order of the day, as we've seen in previous organizations like Enron historically and other such organizations, WorldCom, we've seen it in Steinhoff in different shapes and forms. It has massive knock-on implications for everyone, including the men in the street. Do, do you think an instance like we saw happening this week, I mean, a lot of people were sort of questioning, not that, if, if I'm not mistaken, Agritzi was not necessarily arrested for what he only spoke yes, about yeah. um, at the commission. I mean, there was more added on to that. But, you know, it's a timing thing, and suddenly now he has been arrested after all of these years of investigations and things being spoken about, Busasa. But... Would this hinder other whistleblowers from stepping forward? I would hope so. I think that at the end of the day, you, you've got your conscience to deal with. At some point in time, you actually stand up and say, you know, I've got to actually do the right thing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we're also needing to see consequences. Mm. You know, we, it, it's all good and well to have the rhetoric about wrongdoings and about these things happening. But as we start seeing people taken to, taken to book and being punished for what they've done, then I think that instills confidence in people that this is something that they can do to be part of a, a, a solution in what requires a multifarious set of things from legislation, from governance. But at the end of the day, intentionality starts at the heart of it all. Yeah. What is the intention of, of these leaders in business, in, in government and in organizations in terms of what they're doing and why they're doing it? Is it simply about self-gratification and, and uh, self-enrichment? Or is it much more about how do we build a sustainable, growing, inclusive economy. Does a whistleblower come forward knowing that they have to face the repercussions? They've actually dealt it with inside them, and they know that more than likely they're going to be punished for this, and in a big way. Well, that, that only, only if the case is that they themselves are implicated. Not all whistleblowers are going to be implicated. No, certainly not, yeah. No. But in an event that they are implicated. It's a really interesting question, because 
I think that there must be different drivers and motivations for them doing it. I think that part of them might, some of them might feel that if I put my hand up and if I blow the whistle now, perhaps I'll get a lighter sentence. Perhaps I'll be let off a little bit more. Maybe they look at it and they say, actually, this thing's running out of control. It's actually going to go only one way and I'm going to be in the midst of it. Yeah. So why not actually find a way out, which is often the case. It's often in, the in, case, in, yeah. In, so. I mean, it, for Agriti, is this possibly the case that we're looking at right now? That's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not inside his heart and his head. No. I, I, but I think that that is the case. I would, I would imagine so. Yeah. I, I don't f- think that whistleblowers who have been deeply involved and implicated suddenly become, have a, a, a Damascus moment and become suddenly righteous overnight and, and uh, do it that way. I think that they're doing it. There's an by, intent behind the scenes. They're doing the scene. it because there's a self-interest here. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a double-edged sword because... In one way, it's good that this stuff is coming out, but it's also they are hoping to get benefits from it. What about the advent of social media and, you know, the the whole issue of, you know, we suddenly see all these anonymous accounts, okay, and I'm not necessarily talking about the bots, but they're actually run by people that rely on people dropping information and files to them, and then they come and explode it onto social media, and then it starts bubbling out of control, and whatever happens thereafter happens. So social media in, in this day and age of whistleblowing? I think social media in today's world means that you've got to be very careful what you do and say and what you're caught up in because it, the moment it gets out there, it, can, it is just going to extrapolate. And so at the end of the day, you can use it to your benefit if you're smart and if you engage with social media in an appropriate way. You can get good messages, you can get right messages, you can make it work for you. You can create all sorts of perceptions. Perception is reality. Mm. How we, what we see and deem to be reality is our reality, even if it might not be. Yeah. So social media is a very powerful and in many ways a very dangerous thing, yeah. but it's also a very useful thing. Yeah. And I hope that over time, uh, disciplines and good diligence would, be, would apply in how people get to use it because it it can very easily blow up in your face. If we look back at the history of whistleblowing in South Africa, how how has it shaped it and how common is it? Gosh, I don't think it's been that common. I think people have been very fearful. Yeah. If you think about where a lot of the of this defibination has taken place has been inside of government mm. and government are very powerful people. If you look at the Vasasa thing and, and what goes with it, it's governments involved with it. This is not just like a Steinhoff that was uh, malfeasance and, and uh, fraudulent activities that were done wrong, absolutely, and, and needing their, their punishment, but a little bit different to, to the, the, the integration of politics with business and where how proliferate it was and people feared and and yeah. we've seen and heard of people being having their lives threatened uh, this is not just i'm going to get get you this is i'm going to get you and take you out so death is one of the options that people have been confronted by whether real or imagined yeah. and that has been therefore i think a a delay a, a delaying factor in getting people to to step up to the plate yeah just finally as as, as i let you go um brian in terms of encouraging whistleblowing um, and organizations sort of saying, we do encourage it, we want you to come forward and tell us, it, how do you do something like that? Well, firstly, you rename it. You call it Truth Champions or something along those lines. I don't know what it is. Yeah. You know, because, and, you, and you award people for that. You have, have an award in your companies for the most authentic person of the year or the most authentic act or the most honorable act or to, to start instilling that. If you look at Rwanda, for example, they've introduced this thing called Umaganda, which is every Saturday, for the last Saturday of the month, everybody, including the president, goes out and does litter collecting. So Rwanda is a perfectly clean state. You find litter nowhere, yeah. just in a matter of 15 odd years. And it's become, whilst it's been legislated and policed, people say, the man in the street says, oh, it's just a lifestyle now. So you're able to sometimes through, through prescription and through rules and through governance and other times through encouragement, get people to step up and, and look at a new way of, of, of operating. Change the lenses, look yeah. at the world differently and see how you can, how you can yourself be a much better and, and evolved and actualized person by getting on the bus of doing things properly and looking not just about me, but how do I make this world? How do I be a great global citizen, yeah. which I'm part of, and a great 
country citizen. Fantastic. Well, Brian, thanks for uh, thanks for that. Your insights this morning, Brian Hatting. He's the founder and CEO of uh, Psycan. It's a company that focuses on leadership skills. Uh, talking to us about the importance of whistleblowers. Perhaps you're right. Let's change the name, whistleblowers. Maybe it's got change a bad connotation towards it. So, uh, truth tellers, <laughs> truth sayers. I don't know. Yeah. Give truth us a champions. name. Yeah, yeah. We'll do something. Truth champions. Truth whatever avengers, it is. Whatever. All right. Thank you again. Thanks. Thank